Tov, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yossi Moalem, and I've been a professional software programmer for the past 20 years. And in these 20 years, I worked for quite a few companies, and obviously I saw quite a few code bases. I think it won't come as a great shock to you if I'll say that I found some of these code bases much harder to use than others. But this is not what I want to talk to you about, because this is not what I think a real bad code base is. The worst case uh, of a code base is a code base that you read, you think that you understand, you start writing code for, your code does seems to work, and then at some point it doesn't. And it doesn't start, uh, it stopped working because uh, you used some infrastructures or some APIs that took some assumption or had some preconditions that you were not aware of them. And the reason that you were not aware of them is because it wasn't inbounded within the code. So when you look at easy to use, hard to misuse, you most likely come to this example. I'm sure that all of you saw it several times. We have the class date here that takes three integers for day, month, and year. And when we use it, it's not very clear if I mean February the 1st or, uh, or January the 2nd. And the solution that everyone comes with is to use strong types. We have three supplementary classes for day, month, and year. And now our class date does not take plain integers. It takes instances of those classes. Now, because those classes have explicit constructor, we can't just send plain integers, and we have to send uh, instances of those classes. And now it's very, very easy to see that what I actually mean is February, February the 1st. I don't like this example at all. I don't like the problem that they're trying to solve, and I don't like the resolution. Let's start with the resolution because it's a lot simpler. I think that for this specific problem, there is much easier, much simpler solution, and that's simply to change the middle argument, the month argument, into an enum, and then our call site looks something like this, and it's very easy to see that this time I mean January the 2nd. Now, obviously, this is not a generic solution. We can't always replace one of the arguments with an enum. Let's say that we have class point that can be created either by Cartesian notation with x and y or by polar notation with radius and azimuth. Obviously, we can't replace any of them with an enum. And then uh, strong types may be a good solution, but it's important to know that strong types are not the only solution. Just to name a few, we can have named constructor. In this case, our constructor is private. We don't care what the arguments are. We don't, case, we don't care which notation it uses. When we want to create an, in, an instance of the class point, we either call a create Cartesian or create polar. And by the name, it's very obvious to know which uh, notation we are using. Another, another option is to use tagging. We add another two uh, enum classes one for polar and one for Cartesian, and our constructor will now take an instance of one of these uh, enums, and with this it will distinguish which notation we are using. The last uh, method I'd like to show, we add two nested classes for uh, Cartesian and polar. Our constructor, again, is private, and when we want to create an instance of class point, we create an instance of the nested class, which creates the... Uh, the class point. I think this is quite an elegant solution. This is one of that I like a bit more. So why am I showing you all of this? Do I think that strong types are evil and you should never use them? Of course not. Strong types is a good idea. It's something that we all should be aware about and have under our belt. However, it is not a silver bullet. When I managed a code that, use, that had extensive uses of, of uh, strong types, I, I found myself keep going back and forth to see what this type is and what that type is, and just to find out that, it, that they're just wrappers around simpler types that do not really add a lot to the logic of the application. I found that there's too many supplementary classes. I mean, think only the two classes that we talked about, class date and class point, have seven supplementary classes. That's a lot. So what we really want to do is to try to limit the amount of these supplementary classes, to reduce the amount of boilerplate that we have. And one way to do it is to check how many real classes use each one of these uh, supporting class. If it's being used once, 
then maybe it's not a, such a good idea to use strong type for this type. If it's used throughout all the application, then maybe it is a good idea. And a good guideline, a good starting uh, point is to think if our supplementary class that we want to add is in the domain of our application. So if, for example, we are writing a calendar application, it's very likely that day, month, and year would be used throughout all the application. If, however, we're using it the date only to represent the date in one screen or another, it will probably be used only once, and then maybe we should resort to a different uh, solution. So that's what I have to say about the resolution. Now let's talk about the problem. But before we talk about the problem, I'd like to try to classify the ease of incorrect use. How easy it would be for me to use my API incorrectly? So the best thing is that incorrect code will not compile. That's the case when we're using strong types. If I'll pass a day instead of month, it will not compile. The second best thing is that incorrect code will crash. And I don't mean that it will eventually class will break some invariants and then at some point it will crash. Although it's better that it will crash than it will cause us da data loss or data corruption. But still, it's not what I mean. What I mean is that the minute that we'll use the API incorrectly, we'll detect it on runtime and will crash immediately or detect it to do something with it. Third best thing is that we'll need to look at the prototype in order to get correct usage. That was when, wh where we started with our class date. We had to look at the constructor and then we know what each uh, argument represents. Now far, 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 far worse than this is Cases where we need to read a lot of comments, documentation, example, in order to get it right. Now, by no means do I, do I mean that API that you should read comments for read the documentation is bad. What I mean that if you look at the API and it looks very simple, and in some cases it works without reading the documentation, but then in the comments or in the documentation you have some assumption, some precondition, that the user cannot be aware about without reading it, that's something that's bad. And we'll see an example for this in just a few slides. But before we go to the next slide, please don't laugh at the next example. It was actually a part of an interview question that I used, beginning of an interview question actually, that I used to give to candidates and most of them did not get it um, very fast. What I asked them to do is simply to add setters for the class date so we'll be able to update it. And the vast majority of the people came up with these three functions. So I'm telling them, okay, we have now February the 1st, we want to go one day backwards, I'm, I'm setting the date, I have uh, February the 31st, which is an invalid date. What do you do about it? The vast majority of the people did understand the problem. There were a few that said, okay, we'll call it in the other way, but the vast majority realized the problem. And the answer that uh, most of them gave is, okay, let's write a comment. Writing a comment is exactly what we defined as the worst case scenario. I mean, this API looks pretty simple, right? Nobody re will read comments about it. So yes, we kind of know that you should take care of this, but no one will really read comments for an API that looks as simple as this and that will work and will seem to do what it's supposed to do. So when I pointed this to them, uh, the vast majority of them suggested to use transaction. Transaction looks something like this. We start a transaction. During the transaction time, the date may be invalid. As long as when we enter the transaction, the date is valid again. The main problem, one of the main two problems with this code is that there is no enforcement. No one forbids me of calling set date without starting a transaction. So again, we can use the API incorrectly and it would be very, very easy for us. The way to mitigate this is that we'll add an extra argument to set date, set month and set year obviously follow the same pattern. And now on top of the new day that we want to put, we'll put a transaction handle. We'll add a function uh, start transaction that will turn to us transaction handle. What this transaction handle is, is just an narrow AI object that internally will probably lock a mutex. So when user wants to use it, they first acquire the handle by calling a start transaction. Here I'm binding it to a constant reference that will prolong the lifetime of the temporary RII that I got from the start transaction. And then I can use this reference as the first argument for set date. Set date will obviously do nothing with this argument. The whole point of it is just to force the user 
to have a transaction in flight while they calling a set date, set day, sorry. Um, when we'll go out of scope, my reference will die, and then the lifetime prolonging of the RAI will die, and the RAI will be destroyed, releasing the uh, lock. So this way, I'm forcing the user to actually have a transaction. But quite honestly, for something as simple as set, updating a day to use heavy machinery like transactions, looks a bit like a novicule to me. So we added the requirements to be able to update it. We came with a solution that had a problem. And if uh, we have a problem that's hard to solve, maybe we should think of a different design that will take the problem away altogether. And in this case, it's very, very simple. The only thing that we need to do is just replace the three methods with set date that takes the three integers. And then we don't have the problem of in which order to call those methods. But what if I don't want? What if I want to, for example, to iterate the first of every month? Okay? I checked and I know that every month has its first. Trust me, I checked a lot of calendars, I checked the documentation, every month has its first. So I want to just iterate and set months, January, then February, then March, April, and so on and so forth. Or I know where I'm starting, and I know that I can update the date on the, the day. I know what I'm doing. Give me the XF, XF the flexibility in case I want it. Most candidates and most people, actually, most developers that I asked thought, yeah, that sounds like a very good idea. No, it is not. If I see this, three, the three, this API, chances are that I'll first see the three functions, set date, set month, and set year, because there are three of them and only one of set date. So I'll see them first and I'll use them. Secondly, normally we don't get the day, month, and year from thin air. We have to calculate. Let's, let's say, for example, take them from the GUI. So if I'm using set day, uh, I have three very short uh, function calls. Set day and the short line that calculate, that get fetch day from the GUI. Set month and the same, uh, something that fetch date from the GUI. Instead of set date, that will be a very long function call, and we all prefer short calls. So. By giving this to the users, I'm actually tempting them into using incorrect API, inc the incorrect usage. So if you take only one thing from this, from this whole talk, let it be this. The more flexibility you give to the user, the more freedom you give them, and the more power you give them. The more power you give the users, the more chance they have to getting it wrong. The common way should be the safe way and should be the easy way. The uncommon way may be unsafe and can and should be hard. In this case, we are not even limited, by removing the three functions, we are not limiting even the, the usability of, the, of this class. They can do exactly the same. So yes, in some cases, they'll have to work a bit harder. Fine, by, because in this way, we are protecting them from using the wrong API. Some candidates noticed that the prototypes of the constructor and the set day looks quite similar. And they suggested removing the set altogether, using it something like this. Instead of set date, we're creating an object and using the uh, assignment operator. I disagree with this. First of all, when I see class date that does not have a set uh, function, it makes me wonder. Is there some invariance here that I don't understand? Is there some assumption here that I don't know? I also need to think how to set the date. And I don't like to think. Thinking takes energy. Ask anyone that had any mistake, ask him why you get it wrong. I guarantee you the first three words that you'll say is because I thought. Don't let you use the things, they will not get it wrong. The intention of constructor is to create an object for you to use. The intention of constructor is not to create a temporary object that then would be used by the copy constructor in order to update an existing date. Yes, a C++ programmer, we know that it will work, but it's a hack. Use the functions for their intent. And if you need another function, write it. I mean, we just removed three functions that you thought that is a good idea. So I think we're in a good uh, balance now. If I have it. Exactly, that's exactly my point. The comment was that if I won't have a setter, maybe I have immutable uh, class. And yes, that's exactly my point. When I don't see setters, I think that it's immutable. But this class is not. 
and the API, because the API does not indicate that it's mutable, I would assume that it's immutable. I mean, I will see that I have a copy constructor, and then it will make me think like, what the fuck is going on here? It's if only, uh, I won't see the <laughs> exactly. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is how to handle bad dates. So here, obviously, I'm trying to assign a bad date for my date. So we want to reject it without touching the object. We, we don't want to start modifying it and then midway discover that it's wrong and leave it half modified. We don't like our object to be in a consistent but unspecified state. So we want to reject it immediately. And obviously, we need to uh, report the error. The way that we report the error depends on the error reporting mechanism that we have installed in our application, but that's way too big a topic to talk about it now. It deserves at least an hour talk by itself, so this is totally outside of, our, of the scope of this talk. What I do want to talk about is how to report an error from the constructor. Now, by far, the most common way is to split the construction into two phases. We'll have a constructor that cannot fail, and we'll have an init function that, may, that initializes our, uh, cl our class. I don't really like this. Uh, it's very common, but I don't really like it because, in my opinion, a constructor should return to us a ready-to-use, fully initialized working object. In this case, it's obviously not. I mean, in this case, it's good because class date, that its constructor does not take any argument, what does it even return to us? But at least it's obvious that it's not returning to us a valid date. Some classes, by their nature, the constructor should not take any argument. So how do I know that I need to call init afterwards? It's not really C++, is it? But there again, it's so common that it won't shock anyone if they'll see it. I don't like it, but it's very common, so... Okay, I can live with this. The second most common way is to throw an exception. I mean... In C++, that's the only way that, yes? Okay, so the question was, do I prefer to have a constructor that does receive arguments and then, uh, and then calling an init? In this case, okay. So the question was, do I prefer to use a, this method or the next method? So let me just discuss the next method because I do need to uh, report the error. If the user uses the one with the argument, I still need to report the error. So let me just describe the next method and then I'll answer this question. So this one, uh, we throw an error because that's the only way that C++ gives us in order to uh, report an error from the construction, from the constructor. I don't really like this idea either because who would raise a yellow flag in this line of code? Who would really think, just a minute, class date needs to be wrapped with try and catch? I wouldn't. It looks bizarre. I have to say that when I did see, a co I did manage code that uses this, it didn't look very slick. And in answer to your question, I would prefer to have one way. If I need to report an error, I prefer to have it one way. I mean, it doesn't provide any uh, added benefit to have two ways to create and initialize the class. It would just look very weird because I need to know, okay, if I'm calling the default constructor with no argument, I need to call init. But I don't need to call init if I'm using this constructor. I prefer to have one way and one way, one way only for anything, and especially to create an object. It just looks very strange. Now, variation on this, which is a lot, a lot worse in my opinion, is to use flag. Now, I'm not re uh, even throwing. In the previous case, at least if I didn't, I had a mistake, my application will terminate. Hey, what will happen? Who will remember to check it? The API does not even indicate, nothing indicates that I'm using a flag and I need to check after the construction that, the, that I finished initializing the object. That's like pure evil. It's like no. At least in my opinion, but because I did see it in the wild. C++23 provided to us XTD expect, expected. Before 20, uh, C++23, we could use exact or oh, very similar methodology with STD pair. Yes, it won't be as slick, as nice, and as automatic, but the same principles will, op will uh, remain. Our constructor now is private, and we have 
uh, create date method. Similar, just a second, very similar to the named constructor that we had before. Uh, the only, the main difference is that now we're not returning an object, we're returning an expected of the object. And in order to use it, we first call the static method, we return to us the wrapper, either the expected or the pair, and then we can check if it's valid. If it is valid, we can dereference it. So yes, user can write something like this. But in my opinion, it's just like we're interpreting cast, uh, class date to class day to class month in the strict type. If users really want to shoot themselves in the legs, with C++ they can do it. I mean, I can't stop people from doing silly stuff. But the API does indicate, I'm not returning to you a class date, I'm returning a pair, or I'm returning expected. You should check it. Someone that sees something like the bottom line here, in code review, yes, they should definitely raise a yellow flag. Yes, there was a question over there? Okay, the, qu the question was about uh, here, I need to expose an in, is a valid method. I can expose it or I can make this uh, flag private, but there's nothing in the API that indicates me that I should do it. I can very easily do it without checking the API and users that in doing code review and you see date, date, no one will see that there is something wrong here. If I use the method when it's not valid, it's unspecified behavior, okay? And that's why I don't like it. There's nothing that forces me to use it. And there's nothing that instructs me in the API to use it, that, that this is how I'm using it. Uh, here, when we have reported, the nice thing about this is that, just a second, that unlike in the constructor that I need a different report, error reporting mechanism for throw, for example, here the error reporting remains the same. I can use exactly the return, exactly the same thing. I can use the same error reporting mechanism as I'm using throughout all of my application. Yes. The question was that both this and the flag requires the user to do something. But, but uh, I'll get to the, next, the second part later. The, different, the main difference between this and the flag is here the API indicates to you that you need to do something. When you're using a flag, the API does not indicate anything, and that's the bad thing about it. Here you can see, when I'll see this line, I will raise a yellow flag. When I see just something day day with the flag, it will not raise a yellow flag. And the second question was why not revert to exception? Yes, exception is valid, it's just head on heart. When you see this line, would you see that there's something wrong with it if you see it in a code review? Most people will not. And so yes, my application will terminate, but do we want the application to terminate? Maybe I can handle it. We're normally not expecting the constructor to throw exception. Maybe it's our fault, but that's the way that we, we write code. I actually have, I don't know if I said, uh, when I did manage code that looked like this, that used exception this way, it looked very untidy, to me at least. I did manage quite a large code base that used it, and it wasn't very slick. But let's continue, and uh, because we have a bit more that I want to talk about. Um, and I want to talk about naming, because I think that naming is probably not only with uh, easy to use, hard to misuse, but in programming in general, I think it's one of the most important things. My wife keep, keep laughing at me that I'm obsessed by names, but unfortunately we do not have time to discuss it as much as I would like to. So I strongly recommend to you watching Kate Gregory's talk, Naming is Hard, Let's Do Better. I do wanna talk about a few small things. First of all, it's not even about names, it's more about prototypes. I think that I'm not the first person that you hear saying that empty is probably one of the standard library worst two names. It's very bad because it's not very obvious if it means clear or is empty. So let's look at the usage. If it means clear, then obviously the first line is the correct usage and it will compile. The second line will not, line will not compile because we're trying to assign void into a uh, variable. So it's very good. Okay, the name is not very uh, explicit, but at least only the correct way will compile. If, it's an, if it means is empty, then the first line is the correct usage and obviously it will compile. Unfortunately, the second line, which does nothing, will also compile. Now, C++17 provides to us with a no discard attribute that will generate a warning if 
uh, we decorate empty with the no discard, and then at least we get a warning. But for those of you who are not using C++17, who is here still not using C++17? Raise of hands very quickly. So there are a few. OK, uh, you can use this wrapper template. Uh, what it does, it keeps track of whether or not the casting operator was called. If the destructor was called before the casting operator was called, it means that our value was not consumed. And then we can, <coughs> and then we can abort, we can assert, we can write to the logs, we can do all sorts of violent things to our caller. The body of the function does not need to be changed at all. We only need to change the prototype from the return type into the no discard uh, wrapper of the type. And our call site also does not change. So that, that I think is very nice. And then when we move to C17, uh, we can do a very fast, very easy find and replace and replace all these wrappers with the attribute no discard. So in this case, the minute that we'll call the API incorrectly, we'll detect it and we can assert. Now this thing is something that I actually thought about for years, literally years. What is the better name? Collect data for gateway statistics or aggregate statistics from all threads? In more general, because I didn't think about these things for years. I thought about the concept. What should we name our function? The context on which we are running or what we are actually doing? Or maybe how we're doing it? So I was coming back from work one day and I was really, really, really upset because we just finished implementing a new client for statistics. We had a lot of clients. We sent statistics for numerous clients, SMTP, and a lot, a lot of them. And we just implemented another one, and we got crash. And I looked at the stack trace. And obviously, I recognized it because I didn't write the code, but I uh, code reviewed it, and I proved it. And I realized that if it would have been two years from now, and I didn't remember the code, I would not, I would have, not have known which statistic are we collecting. I, I would have known that we're collecting statistics, but I wouldn't have known to which client. And I was very, very upset because, I, as I said, I'm very obsessed with names and I took a lot of care about making sure that every name is a good name, in my opinion. And suddenly I'm looking at it and I realized that I failed until I reached this exact point when I had my eureka moment. And what I suddenly realized is that when you name a function, you're not naming your baby or your cat or your dog or whatever pet you have. You're naming a function. And a function does not live in a void, it lives in a context. And the context in which your function lives is the stack. And you need to name your function according to its altitude in the stack. So think that you're flying now in an airplane and you're in a very high altitude and all that you see is the general area on which we are. You see here that I'm somewhere between Tel Aviv and Herzliya. You don't see a lot more than that. That answers the question of where. And so functions that are very high in the stack should answer the question of where, in which context we are. As we start to descend, we see a bit more details. We see that there is a road here, so probably I'm going somewhere. You still don't have all the details, but you know what I'm doing. So when we're going down in the, in the stack, we should answer the question of what. As we go very low, we, the leaf function, you see all the details. You see here my bike. It's obviously that, that I'm cycling somewhere. That answers the question of how or why. Okay? And for those of you who don't recognize this spot, it's exactly where I had my eureka moment. I wonder specifically last week to take this picture. So let's look again about these two names. We have a... Let's, let me finish and we'll talk later because we're already running out of time. We have the collect data for gateway statistics. That answers the question of what, where we are. We're collecting data for gateway statistics. It also gives us an idea about the surroundings. It indicates that there is some other clients. That answers the question of where. And it's a very good name for a function that is on high altitude, that is on the top of the stack. The other name indicates statistics from all, from all threads Tell us what we are doing. It also indicates that the next function will probably be called get current thread statistics. So it indicates what we are doing. It also explains uh, explain to us a bit about the how. It indicates that 
we, that our counters are not globally. We have per thread counter. It answers the question of what and how. So that's a very good name also, but for much lower function. If you look at this, to, uh, at this stack, authorized process creation, is process allowed to run, check executable reputation, calculate executable hash. They're all good names, but they all answer the same question, what? I, can't, I don't see the whole picture by looking at them, but each one by itself is a good name. If, on the other hand, I'm, I'm seeing this, on process creation is aided, authorize uh, process creation, check executable reputation, calculate executable SHA-256. I know that a new process was created. We got an event notifying us about this event, about this process being created. We're now authorizing if this process is allowed to run or not. One of the methods in which we check is checking its reputation, and we check its reputation by calculating its SHA-256. It gives us a whole story that we didn't have before because different uh, function in different altitudes answers different question. The last thing I want to say, and I know that I'm a bit running late, is please do not lie. This is from a real code base. All the examples are, by the way, from a real code base. So we had our HTTP client that we wanted that in case it doesn't manage to connect to the server several times, we want to try to connect to a different server. So we see, we look at it and we see someone has already implemented this member, a uh, number of failed connection attempts. And you think, yes, we don't have to implement this part of the task. But being the responsible developers that we are, we look a bit further. And we look and we see that, yes, if we fail to connect, we increment this counter by one. Yeah, that's really good. It really looks like it's doing what it's supposed to do. And then we look a bit further and we see that we sleep, but we don't sleep for a constant amount of time. We sleep for one second in the beginning, second, uh, the second time, uh, three seconds in the third time, and so on and so forth. So it's a white lie. It's not really only the number of connection attempts, but okay, I can live with this. But then someone realized that sometimes our server don't, don't just ignore us. It tells us, I'm too busy, hold on. So instead of nagging this server, are you ready for me now? Are you ready for me now? Are you ready for me now? We want to stay for a bit longer to give it some time to settle. And then we see this amazing line. Number of failed connection at 10 plus equals 10. <laughs> and I'll finish with probably one of my favorite examples. Extract configuration. Trust me when I say that this function does a lot more than just extracting the configuration. And the way that I know that is because now I'm lying to you because the real prototype is extract configuration should extract. <laughs> and with this, I'm finished. Thank you for your time. Do we have some time for... <laughs> Let's carry on with questions until they'll kick me out of the stage. So the comment was that maybe our, our names, all of them, are too long. That's actually something that also uh, my wife, when she reviewed this, this uh, presentation and commented that I'm obsessed with his name, also said, I personally like good names, maybe because I switch so, so many jobs and I need to understand code very fast. When I see a long name, I know everything that it does. And I don't think I could have broken these names into class names or uh, namespaces. Personally, I like lo long names. Okay, thank you all very much for your time.